Welcome to the Flag Bearer Channel. This is Little Known Black History Facts. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel. The Great Mississippi River Flood of 1927. Many of us remember when Hurricane Katrina pounded the southeast of New Orleans on August 29, 2005. The resulting flooding affected Greater New Orleans and claimed some 1,464 lives, leaving damage worth $70 billion. However, no one knows of or remembers the Great Mississippi River Flood of 1927 when black men, women, and children were used as barriers to the flood at gunpoint. From Katrina, we can recall the haunting images of black babies, mothers, and males stuck on rooftops. We can remember the support services poor handling of the court nation and the relief effort where black people were left to drown, starve, or die of dehydration, or from the lack of medical care which exposed the United States capitalist government's disregard for black life and the needs of its people. But if Katrina was a bad dream, the 1927 nightmare many folks have not heard of also involves a flood and the United States government's callousness when it comes to African-American people. The Mississippi River, Great Flood of 1927, inundated large areas in Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana. The flood revealed the wide delta of black peonage, or the new slavery, that controlled the lives of slaves freed in 1865 and their descendants 62 years after passage of the 13th Amendment. The flood showed that the shadow of the plantation still loomed large, as little had changed in the Mississippi Delta since emancipation. Most blacks in the region still resided on plantations as sharecroppers and tenant farmers, while many others were forced into coerced labor. In 1927, after weeks of rain, the Mississippi River poured over into hundreds of towns, killing thousands of African Americans and leaving a million people homeless. April was a record-breaking month for rain downpours, and this major storm ultimately put black man against whites, money against honor, and father against son. After months of torrential rain, levees burst from Illinois to Louisiana. An unknown number died, certainly in the thousands. Many were buried under tons of river mud or washed out into the Gulf of Mexico. Hundreds of thousands lost their homes, more than 325,000, most of them black lived in the Red Cross camps for as long as four months. Floods devastated Arkansas, Illinois, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Tennessee, but the worst destruction was in Arkansas. In some places, the Mississippi River was 60 miles wide. Almost twice as much farmland was flooded in Arkansas as in Mississippi and Louisiana combined. Victims kept arriving from all around Arkansas, cold, sick, and hungry. Some found shelter in public buildings or other makeshift locations. Nearly all found themselves without food, water, or dry clothing. The segregated tent cities on high ground could barely hold them all. Disease ran rampant in the overcrowded camps. With the flood water having nowhere to go, much of Arkansas remained underwater through the spring and summer and into September of 1927. Farmers could not plant crops. The carcasses of thousands of dead animals lay rotting in stagnant pools. Mosquitoes found perfect conditions to breed that summer, carrying malaria and typhoid to refugee camps already burdened with dysentery and the threat of smallpox. Emergency workers at the camps were also shocked at the extent of pellagra, a vitamin deficiency disease brought on by lack of protein. Out-of-state emergency workers clashed with local health officials and large planters over the extent and types of aid and to whom such aid should go. In some places, the Red Cross distributed aid directly to the victims, but in others, so as not to challenge the plantation system, relief supplies were given to the large planters who were then in charge of distributing them to their sharecroppers. Planters feared that their sharecroppers both black and white, and mostly deep in debt, 
might not return home from the Red Cross camps, leaving them without enough labor to put crops in the fields when the land dried out. This led to a controversial mandate in which sharecroppers, particularly black sharecroppers, were admitted to and released from the camps only under the supervision of their planters. African Americans needed a pass to enter or leave the Red Cross camps. Some were forced at gunpoint by law enforcement officials to survive on the levees indefinitely and makeshift tents as water rose around them while the would-be rescue boats left empty. They were forced by the National Guard with fixed bayonets to work on the levees, in addition to other flood relief efforts. The deluge swept away everything in its path. To prevent his tenants from fleeing the desolation, one planter locked them in barns and cotton gin houses. Black people who found shelter in public buildings were driven back into the waters at gunpoint. Thousands of flood victims fled to or were forcibly driven to the narrow crowns of the levees, bringing with them nothing but their debt to the planters. Many planters prevented blacks from boarding barges brought to evacuate the homeless masses for fear of losing their cheap labor force. In the Greenville, Mississippi area alone, 5,000 black people were forced to take shelter in warehouses, stores, and similar facilities, while up to 13,000 more lived on an eight-mile-long levee. To make matters worse, the federal government didn't contribute a dime of direct aid to the thousands of flood victims, despite a record budget surplus. The Red Cross established racially segregated camps in the flood zones. Black families lived in floorless tents in the mud without cots, chairs, or utensils, eating inferior ration food. Sometimes forced to work on the levees without pay, black men had to wear tags identifying that they were laborers in order to receive rations and to show which plantation they belonged to. Women with no working husband did not get supplies unless they had a letter from a white man. Policing the camps, the National Guard supervised the workers, whipping and beating the men. At least one black woman was gang raped and killed by guardsmen. Typhoid, measles, mumps, malaria, and venereal diseases ran rampant among destitute tenant farmers and mill workers already weakened from illness endemic to poverty. The Chicago Defender even reported that those who die are cut open, filled with sand, then tossed into the Mississippi River. Such horrors were stark proof that the poisonous legacy of chattel slavery still infected the land some 60 years after the Civil War. Through the modern communications of the day, such as radio, the flood of 1927 drew national attention to the plight of sharecroppers, black and white. It spurred a mass migration of black sharecroppers who had tired of farming, poverty, and debt. Thousands left the plantation as soon as they could, heading north to look for jobs in cities such as Detroit and Chicago. As in most disasters, the 1927 flood saw the best and the worst of humanity. While the flood claimed many American lives and led to one of the largest fundraising drives in American history, the kicker is what President Calvin Coolidge's regime and the Red Cross did against African American people. The Red Cross, along with then Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover, deliberately concealed the abuses that black refugees suffered in Red Cross camps in order to obtain donations for the rebuilding effort. Leading black activists sought to expose the abuses, but the media campaign led by the Hoover administration and the Red Cross characterized the rebuilding effort as one of racial harmony and triumphant success. Hoover then used his mobilization effort to earn him the presidency a year later. Reports about the poor treatment in camps led Hoover to make promises of change to the African-American community, which he broke. As a result, he lost the black vote in the North in his re-election campaign in 1932. Several reports on the terrible situation in the refugee camps, including one by the Colored Advisory Commission headed by Robert Moulton, were kept out of the media at Hoover's request with the pledge of further reforms for blacks after the presidential election in 1928. His failure to deliver followed other disappointments by the Republican Party. Moton and other influential African Americans began to encourage black Americans to align themselves instead with the National Democrats. The floodwaters began to recede in June 1927, but interracial relations continued to be strained. 
Hostilities had erupted between the races. A black man was shot and killed by a white police officer when he refused to unload a relief boat at gunpoint. Near Helena, Arkansas, Owen Fleming was lynched after he killed a plantation overseer who wanted to force him to rescue the plantation owner's mules. The refugee camps also dealt with extreme racial inequality, as supplies and means of evacuation after flooding were given strictly to white citizens, while blacks receiving only leftovers. African Americans did not receive supplies without providing the name of their white employer or a voucher from a white person. In order to fully exploit black labor, blacks were frequently forced to work against their will and were not permitted to leave the camps. The Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 was the most destructive river flood in the history of the United States, with 27,000 square miles inundated in depths of up to 30 feet over the course of several months. More than 200,000 African Americans were displaced from their homes along the lower Mississippi River and had to live for lengthy periods in relief camps. As a result of this disruption, many joined the Great Migration from the South to the industrial cities of the North and the Midwest. The migrants preferred to move rather than return to rural agricultural labor. The Mississippi River remained at flood stage for a record 153 days. The flood of 1927 brought about a political shift, especially among African Americans. Those who had traditionally favored the Republican Party, the Party of Lincoln, since the Civil War, resented the Republican response, or lack of response, and shifted their allegiance to the Democratic Party.
Until next time, if you like little known history facts as I do, please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Press the bell to be notified of future uploads. Thank you for watching.